Livingstone Mchefa. My name is Livingstone Mchefa and I'm the curator of education at the National Gallery uh, since last year, November. And uh, I'll be hosting you today on behalf of the National Gallery, but not only the National Gallery, but the heritage fraternity as a well. whole. Uh, I'll begin by way of introductions to say I'm uh, hosting three gentlemen today. Unfortunately, it's, it's not gender balanced, but I'm honored to have with me on this platform today, Dr. Mamvuto, who is a lecturer, senior lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe in the Department of Art and Design, Art, Design and Education. Uh, I also have uh, the pleasure to welcome Mr. Farai Chabata, uh, who is a senior curator of ethnography at the National Museums and Monuments of Zimbabwe. He's based at the Zimbabwe Museums of Human Sciences. And uh, lastly, uh, but not least, uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce Professor Jesma Mataga, who is the head of School of Heritage Studies at so Plage University. I don't know if I say it properly. Uh, it's quite difficult, but it's in South Africa. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, today's discussion and our title is we want to, we came up with this discussion title on the background that this week we are celebrating International Archives Week where it's a UNESCO calendar event where heritage institutions and archival institutions must come up with, you know, commemorative events and uh, discussions around issues that are pertinent to their day-to-day -day activities. So part of the themes that we are addressing today is on education and heritage. And our discussion today is based on uh, heritage and education in the digital era. But I have tried to bring people who are coming from different backgrounds. Dr. Mavuto is coming from the education background at the University of Zimbabwe. Uh, Mr. Farai Chabata is also a practitioner and an ethnographer. Uh, Professor Mataka, a former curator, a lecturer as well. So I understand also guys and good friends and comrades who are also joining us they are also interested in this either as historians, as lecturers, as educationists, as, as uh, heritage practitioners. So by way of introduction, uh, I would want to start with uh, Dr. Mamvuto, then Professor, and lastly, I hope Mr. Farai Chabata will be connected. By way of introduction, uh, Dr. Mamvuto, uh, take us through your your immediate sentiments on this discussion in terms of heritage and the digital age so that we, 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 we can continue into the full depth of the discussion thereafter. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Livingston. Um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for coming to this discussion, a very important discussion uh, where we look at heritage and uh, education. Uh, in the digital era. It's important that we connect our heritage, our education, and the connecting tool is uh, the digital uh, tool that we should use uh, to connect these, um, these institutions. It's very, very important. And maybe it's important also to first of all, understand or define what we mean by heritage, to have some conceptual uh, grounding in what we mean by heritage. And then with that grounding, how do we connect it with uh, education? And how can we make use of uh, the digital technology to connect uh, these institutions? Uh, we see that uh, galleries, museums are important institutions in the uh, perpetuation of um, cultural heritage. 
So heritage is an important uh, aspect. And without an understanding of what we mean by heritage, it's difficult to understand the future, the current uh, position and also our, our future. Basically, we need to conceptualize heritage, which is to me, uh, what we learn from our practices, what we learn from our past, our beliefs, our practices, everything about us, how we live, how we used to live, how we try to learn this kind of um, knowledge and how we try to pass it on. And we use education as one of the vehicles to pass on this uh, cultural heritage. And uh, it is important that we use certain tools like the digital tools. We have got lots of um, uh, cultural practices that are quite positive in our cultures, in our societies that we need to perpetuate. And um, some of these cultural practices um, have been going on, have been uh, in our societies for quite some time. And it is important now that we use the digital tool to enhance this, uh, this, this heritage. And uh, through our education system, we should be able to uh, perpetuate that. And uh, we see that we have got uh, lots of uh, information that we need to take or to make sure that it reaches a wider audience. And we can only do that. We can only reach this wider audience if we use uh, the digital, digital tool. So it is important that we master the digital tool. We use it efficiently. We use it to uh, reach out to a wider audience. So we are moving from the place-based kind of pedagogy, a place-based methodology to an online kind of learning of transmission so that we are able to reach out to more people. So the digital tool is a very important tool that we can actually use uh, to enhance our transmission of our heritage. And there are a number of platforms, MOOCs, for example, Hangouts on Air, for example, Google Plus, webinar and, and so forth. Those are some of the tools that we can actually use and we can make uh, our learners, our students in various uh, geographical locations to access what we have in our cultural institutions like galleries and museums. So basically I'm saying, let's make use of the digital tools that we have so that everybody, every corner of the country, every corner of the world, of the world can actually access the information that we have from the different societies, from the different cultures. Maybe let me leave this uh, time to other colleagues to come in. Um, let me continue. Thank Next you. One, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm getting you. I, I'm following. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for, for the nice introduction. And uh, I should do ask them to say I had also invited another archivist. Unfortunately, he is in another meeting. I don't know if he's going to join us. Uh, by way of introduction, Prof. Mataga, uh, I'm getting to, uh, as you introduce this, this discussion title, uh, maybe also put into perspective, what really is the digital era? What, what does it entail? What are the main features of something or a, 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 to, to call, to perfectly agree that this is a digital era? What are the main facets? Thank you. Um, um, uh, thank you, thank you, Livingston. Um, let me preface my contribution by uh, saying that uh, I, have, uh, I have gray hair uh, and that puts me in a certain bracket uh, in terms of my uh, understanding and affinities to, to the digital world. Uh, but that does not preclude me from, from making a contribution. I just want to, as a way of introduction, raise three key aspects for me. Uh, and thank you for, for coining together this uh, heritage, education, and the digital age. Just those three 
uh, coinages. Um, have, there's a lot that we, we could say. The, the first thing I want to highlight for me, sitting in a university where we training students for the world of work, is that uh, what we hear, what is clear is that um, the future is digital. Uh, and if you were a doubter like myself uh, and a critique like myself, uh, I think COVID is almost re-emphasized that fact of the future that is digital. In, in, and and it's, its ramifications on, on learning, on the world of work or careers, or even uh, the world of living as we engage just as human beings. You know, we having this um, webinar looking at small screens uh, from different parts of the, of the, of the world. Um, and and that's, that's almost, um, where we've been thrown into and COVID has made sure that we, we are left with very little choice. Even some of us would have resisted a, a sort of 100% immersion into the digital world. The second aspect which is implied in, uh, in, in the topic of this webinar, of course, is, is that there, there's a link between heritage and education. However you define heritage, however broad you define heritage, uh, to include institutions, sites, uh, people's practices, and, and so forth. Uh, that there's, a, there's an understanding that this broad categorization of what we call heritage uh, is a critical element of, um, of, uh, of education. And I'm not in the Zimbabwean context for the past few years, but I know I've heard my colleagues talking of something called the Heritage 5.0. Uh, and perhaps uh, you would be better off um, uh, making us understand this better. But there is a link between education. So museums, galleries, sites, communities, and people are sites of learning. Uh, they are sites where we produce knowledge, but also where we disseminate knowledge. And we pass this knowledge to, to other people, and particularly to, to the younger generation. And this brings me to my last point in this introduction. What is this digital world uh, that, that we've been thrown into? And what are the implications for, for how we, we engage with it? So we, we have had in the past few years a whole lot of um, phrases. It's either the fourth industrial revolution, the, the digital age, the I generation, and so forth and so forth. Which, which has got impl implications, as Dr. Mambuta has said, on sort of how we teach. So the issue of digital pedagogies, as I sit in my office here, my university and all my team are probably teaching uh, uh, via um, uh, online through digital uh, platforms and students are learning and engaging uh, digitally. So the world of digital pedagogies is, is quite key. There's also a question of who our learners are, and perhaps I could talk about this later, uh, about the so-called Generation Z or the, the post-millennials who constitute, it, at least in my context of a university, uh, the broader um, uh, uh, dynamics of our students and, and how they engage and learn. They were born in, in, in this generation of uh, of the digital and are spending a whole lot of their life on small screens. We are left with no choice in terms of how we, we capture them. Um, so they learn in certain ways that are different in the ways that I was taught at University of Zimbabwe so many years ago. How does this generation engage? Because if we don't understand that, perhaps our teaching may be more self-referential and not very, very effective. I also want to raise this because as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just a hopeless um, uh, um, a critic, uh, critic uh, someone who likes critic. As we go into the digital space, there is the good, there is the bad. And we, we, we need to be aware of these things, uh, even as we teach and, and engage as, institution, as institutions with, uh, with the students. We are battling in my field with um, an emerging field, uh, which my, some of my colleagues are calling 
uh, critical um, um, digital pedagogies that sort of want to embrace the, the advantages of going digital, but also acknowledge sort of the disadvantages, the dangers uh, that the, the digital world pose. Because if we do not equip our students with that level of awareness, uh, we may be doing a disservice even to the project of learning and uh, di disseminating knowledge. Um, so I think those would be my, my opening uh, remarks uh, and thank you for the opportunity, Livingston. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, Mr. Chabata, uh, by way of introduction, I would, I'd also want you to, to address this uh galleries museums archives uh over the years traditionally they have been trusted sources of knowledge but is it still the same thing in this digital era and are they prepared to 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 to, to hold on to that you know responsibility to remain reliable and a very trusted sources of knowledge in terms of how they go about their business daily uh, you can introduce your, your, yourself in, in terms of the topic of the day, but briefly, because you are a practicing ethnographer at a museum, I, I feel you should be actually the person who should bring into perspective this idea, whether we, we as practitioners or as galleries or museums or archives, are we still going to remain the same trusted sources of knowledge that we used to be, or it's a new phase altogether where with the visual spaces, visual galleries, everything is now dynamic. Uh, up to you, Mof. Um, thank you, uh, Livingston. Um, and uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to share. I hope you can hear me now uh, after my uh, roller coaster experience with uh, uh, the digital world. Um, I don't want to repeat what uh, the former speakers have already highlighted, uh, but my take, of course, when I was invited uh, to participate in this very interesting discussion it was uh, basically uh, three things uh, in terms of uh, that the, the youth are the future and uh, how their presence on online uh, platforms and interaction with uh, gadgets just uh, blows my mind. Uh, even four year olds, three year olds, in fact, tell us that uh, we are indeed in the uh, digital world, and uh, it's not it's a no-brainer. But uh, at the same time, uh, given the part of the world we live in, uh, we should not be under uh, any illusion uh, in our appreciation of access issues. There are also implications in terms of our presence, or if you want, our arrival in in that uh, age, maybe we are at different points of entry into that world, uh, given the dynamics of um, how we live, how the diversity of our society, not just from a cultural perspective, but also from uh, accessing uh, or partaking in this uh, digital world. We are, we, we are probably not um, at the uh, same level, so I wish, I mean, to raise that as a point of reference for much of maybe what I will say as a practitioner in a, a traditional museum, if you want. And then, of course, um, there are issues to actually that are more directly related to what you raised, Livingston. You know, we can't keep the gates. The gates have been opened. Uh, by, uh, by the digital world, uh, like Dr. Mamvuto has highlighted, uh, you know, the museum is no longer just a space uh, in a physical sense, but of course, uh, there are virtual galleries, virtual tours, 
that open access, even access to sites for going on that would have ordinarily remained at the margins of uh, heritage discourse, heritage conversation. There is um, open access to information, to even the work we do. So, I mean, uh, as for our readiness, I think we need a lot of introspection. And my challenge, even making it uh, to this very conversation, speaks to um, where we are and maybe what we need to do uh, to be really prepared. We can't afford, in short, to do business as usual. We can't ignore change, because change will destroy us almost literally. Thank you, Mr. Chabata, for, for, for the quite, you know, uh, provocative, you know, remarks. Uh, now, this is my, my, my next round, where you three guys, our presenters, right? I will give each one of you to make a full presentation of this topic today, uh, so that uh, everyone else who is on the platform today is able to interrogate so that we can discuss it further. Uh, by way of introduction, we've been trying to focus on key elements of the title, uh, but now you are free to contribute and discuss and, you know, in the manner that you felt is relevant to contribute to this discussion today. I'll start with Dr. Mamfuto and uh, Prof. Mataga, you'll be the next. Then uh, Mr. Chabata, you'll be the last one. I will not be interjecting in between uh, if Dr. Mamvuto, you are done, then Prof. Mataga, you are the next. I will only come thereafter. But ladies and gentlemen who are joining us today, if you feel there is an issue that you want to be discussed, if you have a question, just bring it to the chat table. We can take it and we can direct it if it is there, meant to be addressed by one of our presenters today. Uh, Dr. Mamvuto, up to you. You are on mute, you are on mute. Thank you very much, Livingstone. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yes. Right. Uh, my contribution is that uh, looking at the digital era and looking at heritage and looking at uh, education, we need to develop some kind of symbiotic relationship amongst these three pillars, which means each of these pillars needs some kind of introspection as uh, one of the colleagues said, because for example, the museum, the gallery now has a 21st century visitor, which means they need to introspect and come up with uh, methodologies, pedagogies, and uh, systems that can accommodate the 21st century visitor. I believe galleries and museums, which are the cultural uh, custodians, have got uh, lots of informational texts. They've got lots of multimedia content, which they can actually package in some form and through the digital tool, um, make it accessible to this expanded um, audience. When I talk about an expanded audience, I'm looking at uh, the school system. I'm looking at um, institutions that are outside our geographical location. I'm looking at individuals with, with some kind of interest um, in our institutions, in our culture, in our, in our heritage. So these institutions, the galleries and museums need to think carefully and repackage this informational text. And uh, they need to uh, repackage our um, uh, multimedia content in a form that is accessible to this expanded um, uh, audience, which means basically they need to reorganize information dissemination strategy, uh, strategies that are compliant with the 21st century. 
I'm not saying they are not doing that. Uh, it's just uh, something that I'm suggesting or putting forward so that uh, we think about it. So we need to think about digital outreach package and uh, programmatic series that are going to assist this uh, expanded uh, audience. So which means basically museum educators, gallery educators, uh, experts in the various areas, the teachers need to collaborate, they need to work together and make this happen. And we are looking at a client-driven kind of uh, pedagogy. What do our clients need? What do our learners need? What do our education systems require these days? And then through understa understanding their requirements, their needs, uh, their expectations, we can <clears throat> organize um, or repackage our informational text. We can uh, uh, repackage our, um, our content so that it's client driven. I'm also looking at uh, the school system itself where we are looking at the young generation that is going to benefit from um, these museums and galleries. We need to think about uh, a flipped classroom situation, a flipped class classroom where we are engaging more in panel discussions, where we are in, uh, in, in engaged in um, uh, gallery tours, where we are engaged in collaborative uh, activities, in symposia, in lectures, and, and, and so on, so that we can uh, access more information uh, that is available in our various institutions. Looking at the digital era and looking at the tools that are available in this digital era, I'm looking at self-directed learning which means as institutions, whether museums, galleries, and schools, we should facilitate uh, our um, learning so that uh, it's self-directed and uh, it's experiential for our learners. So which means we need to create those systems, those platforms, so that uh, learning can still take place without uh, our, our presence. So I'm looking at... Um, two basically approaches that we can use. Uh, the synchronous uh, approach where there is um, uh, some kind of instant interaction with the various participants uh, and we are using uh, live kind of uh, platforms and technologies and uh, it's instant, instant messaging and, and, and so on. And we are also looking at the asynchronous kind of uh, interactions that can take place where if you cannot access the instant kind of um, interaction, then you can access the delayed kind of interaction. And that way we can actually reach out to a number of um, uh, our, our clients, our audiences and, and, and so forth. So learning through the digital era is learning that is supposed to be active. Learners are supposed to uh, engage uh, or interact with lots of materials, whether they are images, uh, whether they are videos, audios, and so on. That should be encouraged. So that's one advantage of the uh, digital uh, technology. So basically, I'm saying institutions should embrace this technology so that uh, the expanded on the audience can uh, access um, our institutions, which are cultural um, custodians. So online pedagogical uh, strategies, they open up the boundaries. The boundaries are no longer there. Like one colleague indicated that the gates are now open through the use of these uh, technologies. So let's you make use of interactive virtual learning so that our learners can access some of the institutions that are miles and miles, uh, miles and miles 
away from us. That's my take for this digital era. Thank you very much. It's me now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mambu, for, for, for your uh, thought-provoking uh, intervention. I, I, I will be short, and I want to raise a little bit, expand on the three points that I raised earlier. The, the first one will be the, what I see as the role of heritage in education. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the audiences and the, um, the sort of the pedagogical opportunities that uh, is presented by these audiences. Um, and then lastly, I'll, I'll raise a point of, uh, of uh, critique and caution. I, let me start by talking about heritage and education. And, and why I think the, the link between the two is, is, is critical. Um, where I am sitting, and I see some of my colleagues who are also in South Africa, I see uh, Dr. Masakure here. Uh, the, 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 we almost calling it the big D, which talks, which is really about decolonization. Uh, and in South Africa, beginning from about 2015 and what happened, uh, and, and how this has spread around the world. It calls for, for decolonization, uh, not only of, 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 her, of heritage, but also of education. And universities are having to deal with this. If we agree that uh, museums, art galleries, and, uh, and sites are educational spaces, they, they also need to consider the process of unraveling themselves. Because look, we all know the history of museums and, and galleries and, and archives uh, as sort of product of, uh, of uh, Euro-American uh, conceptions of, uh, of modernity. Now, they, they, they still play an important role. And, and, and I think the, 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 the strategy of having heritage as sort of that which underpins educational processes and here with, with the, any discipline at all. If, you, if you're teaching students science, uh, if you're teaching students medical sciences, if you're teaching sociologists, if you're teaching marketers and heritage man, and, 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 uh, and business people and accountants, the idea of underlining those processes with the heritage is quite inviting as a, a strategy for, for decolonizing uh, all these professions, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, particularly in, uh, in Africa. So I see, I see really the linking of heritage and education as an important aspect or a moment uh, through which we can further uh, address um, undoing uh, the damages of uh, sort of colonial processes uh, that marginalized other forms of knowledges and other practices. And that even in teaching uh, our students, we need to make them fully aware of, of some of these um, uh, challenges, um, uh, you know. So, so I think there's a, that, that, that link between heritage and education and underlying in any educational processes with the idea of heritage is, is quite interesting. Of course, the challenge there always is which heritage and whose heritage, because the, 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 there is a potential that heritage becomes a political uh, field where you then have narrow conceptions that are meant to, to, to further uh, certain political ideals. But the idea uh, on its own um, is, is quite interesting. The second point is about our audiences. And, and I touched on this a little bit uh, easier. I just want to give you a few statistics that I got. Uh, the the, the so-called um, Generation Z, uh, uh, who were born after the 90s, uh, constitute the largest um, uh, demographics of our students currently. Uh, and, and the statistics show that uh, most of these uh, students get their first uh, device at an average age of uh, eight or to 10 years, much less actually uh, in my experience. 
uh, they, they grow up in sort of hyper-connected worlds and their access to smartphones and apps and tabs and the internet uh, is relatively higher than any other generation. They spend an average of about three hours a day on a device. And I think with COVID and uh, teaching online, uh, these hours are actually much more. For me, this has got implications on how we teach uh, and how we should teach. The, the first thing is, um, as, as, uh, as a lecturer, as a curator, uh, you, you are not this, um, you're not the sole reservoir of knowledge because knowledge and content is abundant now. All a student needs to do is to go online and they can get much better content than you can deliver as a professor. So Google has got much more content than I have in my head. So our students have got unfettered access to content. So if you decide to teach the way we were taught, where you stand up in class and you, you are the knowledgeable one and you're you are downloading all this data and the information to, to students who you assume don't know anything. In this day and age, that's redundant because it's most likely that the students um, have read and may know much more than you do. That also poses a challenge, which I'll raise the other, uh, on, on the other side. So, so, so what we have also seen is that because of the overabundance of information, the students almost get fatigued and they, they digest uh, information in smaller bits rather than in larger bits. So, so they, 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 they would rather lead, read a short blog or go on Facebook and read a summary or go on Twitter and read also the, the, the bits and smaller bits of information that they have to, to digest. Uh, and, and of course, now the, the aspect of being digitally savvy is, is almost um, a, a requirement because even as they transition to the world of work, those skills are required regardless of whatever profession you, you are going into. So in universities, we have thrust ourselves into the digital world through apps, uh, what we call learner management systems, which are rather flexible. They increase access. Students can engage with the learning material at their own time, and that's an advantage. We work with simulations in virtual spaces. We, we, we sort of break the creative juices of our students by asking them to, if, if I used to request a student to give me a written assignment, I'm asking them to do a video assignment, a multimedia video um, a response to a question. In this way, they are honing in their skills for research, but they're also honing in their skills for making multimedia uh, products, which prepares them better for the world of work. So, so it's all these interesting things that the digital world um, gives uh, to, to all of us. And, and as, as museums, as archives, as heritage spaces, we have a role to play in education. We have to go into this. My last point is about sounding a caution. How do we engage with the digital world? Because the digital world is, uh, is, um, is, is, is a big, big uh, space which comes with uh, challenges also. And I'll raise just a few of, of them. Firstly, in our context, there's a big, there's a big issue around digital inequalities. Uh, you know, I don't know where you are, where I am, most of our students come from relatively impoverished backgrounds. So their access to data or to equipment uh, is sometimes very difficult. And as we do this online thing, we want to make sure that we, we mitigate against the, this. Otherwise, we will reproduce the social inequalities uh, that are still on, on the ground. How are we taking along a student in Uzumba Maramba Pungwe? Uh, as we do this, the same way we, we, we are taking a student who stays in Mount Pleasant. Then there's integrity issues. I mean, uh, there's a lot of information on, on, in the digital space, most of which or sometimes is quite not uh, authentic. Uh, and how do we teach our students uh, to be able to sift through this world uh, and, and sift the, the good stuff from the bad stuff? 
There's also an issue about digital fatigue, and I'm sure we all know this. Uh, there's issues around security. But lastly, what do we lose? Or what are we losing by going digital? This is where I raised that um, I'm partly old school. And, 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 and I think in the, these elements of, of loss, as much as we gain in, in digital um, uh, approaches, um, so, so I know when I'm teaching live in class, the element of communication, you know, physical conduct, eye, eye, eye to eye conduct, students working in groups, a student standing in front of a class and, and, and leading uh, a discussion, all those things, we, we slowly losing them. Uh, and we need to mitigate against that. How else can we compensate for, for that. And for me, it's, I think what Dr. Mambuto was already saying, uh, this idea of uh, blended learning, you know, we should, we should not throw away, as much as we go digital, we should not throw away the physical aspect. I mean, I know as museums, as archives, we value uh, the physical object. We still value that feeling of being uh, in a room filled with the archival documents. Uh, there's something that it does. We still value being in a, in a museum storeroom with objects and interacting with these objects. Uh, so any time where it's doable, I think blended approaches are the best, where we, we sort of doing the digital, but also mixing it with sort of the physical aspects uh, of, uh, of what we do. Uh, I think I'll end here and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Chabata. Mr. Farah Chabata. Hello? Yes, yes, please. It's your turn now. Yeah, I hope you can hear me. I can't see myself. No problem. Um, okay. Uh, you know, um, very interesting issues uh, there raised by my my colleagues. I will be very brief indeed. I mean, um, uh, much more brief than Prof. Um, you know, I, as I highlighted at the beginning, I hope you are still with me. Hello? Yes, we are getting you. Hello? You are loud and clear. Okay. Uh, so I... Okay. My understanding of um, to look at it uh, in a broad sense because I'm not uh, uh, very uh, schooled on um, pedagogical issues, but of course formal and non-formal uh, learning. I think uh, the, the digital space uh, is actually enhanced where access is possible to these to the digital uh, platforms is even for people who might have had or learners who might have had uh, challenges in accessing heritage places museums uh, like people living with um, uh, disabilities and it has also meant that um, learners can learn you know at their own pace in their own way, in, you could even say at their own time. They are not bound by, uh, by the limitations of, um, of, of space. And you know, this is all very cute, very exciting, uh, very attractive uh, development, developments that are, are coming in uh, with uh, digital platforms for us to raise awareness and for heritage knowledge to be shared between learners and instructors, and also to bridge gaps between, uh, say, academics uh, and uh, like, uh, teachers in high school or primary school context. So that uh, maybe we could talk about, I don't know, uh, about knowledge sharing communities uh, that have not uh, existed before, 
and you know it one cannot help uh, getting uh, excited about uh, such possibilities and um, and we and hoping that for example uh, these digital platforms will help to dust the image of museums, galleries, is static, uh, maybe boring uh, places because they are virtual tours. People be um, uh, uh, learners or those interested in heritage can interact with objects or artifacts and, and even zoom in, zoom out for more details than who would otherwise avail. And in the process, uh, as, as audience, is uh, um, or, or as visitors to these digital platforms, they are probably not just um, recipients of information, but uh, they are also they also participate in um, in generating uh, information, knowledge, um, and uh, as if uh, this was not exciting enough, the. The COVID-19 pandemic is literally imposed uh, the digital uh, um, world on us, regardless of our levels of preparedness, uh, which is also a way uh, my caution really emanates. Uh, because, you know, it, the, the, the pandemic is, um, if you like, uh, accelerated uh, the rate and the pace at which uh, uh, digital platforms um, have to be uh, received by, um, by, by, by communities. In, our, in, the, in, our, in, our, in the world of museums, and especially uh, locally, maybe it's true uh, elsewhere, one of the current discussions uh, that has been brought up about with um, uh, expanded audiences and their expectations is ways actually to look at institutional structures and capacities, uh, even in museums, in schools, in colleges, in galleries, whether they are still complex is uh, defined not just by acts of parliament and, uh, and statutes, but also by um, a very informed, a very demanding, if you want, uh, audience. So I think one of the issues is for us to really look at all those um, issues uh, and whether, uh, and, and to see how much um, what, what, what sort of cost uh, this new normal uh, is um, demanding uh, from us uh, at various levels. I know Prof raised the issues of fatigue, but there are also issues of um, unfettered access and how these, um, um, the, the implications they have on uh, issues of uh, traditional management systems of heritage, where sometimes uh, restricted access has been used as a tool to enhance uh, certain values of culture. Uh, so the issue of introspecting on, 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 on this kind of scenario, on this kind of scenarios is also uh, very important as we also uh, seek to navigate in this uh, new uh, the digital world. Um, and then I was also going to raise my concern, of course, with the uh, Loneliness Museum, uh, where, you know, because by, by nature, I don't know how much uh, of um, human, how much we are able to adapt to virtual tours of museums where there are no opportunities to interact in a group, share experiences, share a cookie, or, or hopefully post COVID and all that, those experiences of socialization, they actually, they actually add value 
to um, not only education in my view, but also even to the experience of visiting places and uh, museums. Because they are, I think the world we are, we are going to come to a loneliness economies where things are done online uh, and, they are, and they are robots are doing most of the chores human beings would have otherwise um, uh, performed. Uh, so my issue also is to do with uh, backlash in terms of how, how these places are going to pervert certain values, especially if you look at intangible cultural heritage values and the and then uh, the all this you know really need us to um, not just approach this change in a haphazard manner. There, there is there, there is need for um, combined efforts at police level, at various levels, to just see how communities, how nations can navigate through uh, the new dynamics that have been brought about by um, the digital uh, spaces. And uh, especially the issues, whilst on one hand, um, heritages and cultures that would have otherwise been marginalized can easily uh, found expression through online platforms. But we should also uh, maybe bear in mind uh, about how we represent cultures and uh, heritage even on these online platforms and mitigate against issues of others. Because cyberspace is are also known for vices, like bullying. It's also possible that um, we should do, find a way of not reinforcing certain stereotypes or, or um, of marginalizing cultures, marginalizing uh, people. So there, there's, um, there are opportunities, very real, and also very real challenges that, need our, uh, that, that are actually challenging us to put our minds together and, um, and, and, and embrace the digital world, uh, not just as a fashion phase, but as something that actually adds value. Thank you, I think I've talked. Yeah, you have done, you have done uh, justice to, 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 your, to your part. But uh, if you feel you have got a question, please just drop it to the box or raise your hand, I can pick you before we round up. Uh, there is something that I've picked from all the presenters. Uh, Dr. Mamvuta has been talking of an interactive, you know, approach to learning. Uh, same with Prof. You have been saying these days it's very difficult to think, being the lecturer or being the professor, you might know it all uh, because of this access to information. Uh, but coming back to what Chabata has just said, uh, being practitioners, being maybe a lecturer, being a curator, being an archivist, doesn't also mean that you are a digital expert. How do we make the two speak to each other? Because some of the challenges that we might find in terms of our expectation, in terms of presentation of this heritage, or in terms of even learning style in a digital era, what if I'm of the old school? And it's actually part of my responsibility. How, how do we converge? How do we utilize? How do we write? How do we overcome that kind of a, a challenge? Uh, Any one of you can, you know, come in. But I'm also expecting, you know, others to join us in, in, in before we take um, a roundup to, to our discussion today. Because it's almost an hour now, but we didn't want it to take longer than an hour. But anyway. We don't want to to, 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 to to close you out if you have something interesting to discuss. How do we navigate this cave? We are not digital experts, but at the same time, we are the practitioners. Dr. Mamvuto probably has been the lecturer teaching art, design, and heritage for the last 15 years. Now we, in, we are in the digital space. We have the challenges. But the same challenges are not for the student or for the learner, just like me as an archivist or as a curator. How do we navigate? 
Can I come in? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, that one is, is, is an issue uh, that we need to actually address. Uh, there is no other way that we can uh, use besides being motivated to learn as teachers, as uh, curators and other uh, professions. We know our children are digital natives. They know much uh, or a lot about uh, these, uh, these tools, but as teachers, we need to actually uh, make an effort to learn about this, uh, these technologies. There is no other way that we can, uh, no other way that we can actually use besides getting motivated, uh, getting some kind of induction, uh, going through some learning processes, uh, participating in a number of uh, workshops where these tools are actually uh, taught and, and, so, and so on. So, which means as a teacher, you need to be efficient and you can only be efficient if you know these tools. And if you can, if you master uh, the use of these uh, particular uh, tools, uh, it's, it's important. And maybe just to say something about uh, what uh, Ms. Shabata said about um, missing the socialization aspect because we are going to virtual. Maybe I'm coming from the old school. Yes, the virtual will definitely need that's the 21st century kind of. Um, environment that we are working in, but that socialization should be brought in somehow. And that takes me to what Prof talked about, the blended approach. Let's blend uh, the synchronous and the asynchronous uh, uh, approaches to use of these technologies. And as teachers definitely need to go through some kind of induction and be prepared to learn. And these technologies are changing every time. So master the basics so that at least you know how to navigate. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, anyone to come in? There's also a question by Nesta. She's saying, what measures are being taken to protect online archives in Zimbabwe? Uh, anyone who is comfortable to answer that one, please take it on or to make another contribution. Can I come in? Uh, I, I just want to reiterate what um, uh, Dr. Mambuto said. And, and when I started, uh, like him, I also talked of myself as uh, the BBC born before, before computers. I think what the digital world is doing to us is we, we really left with um, with no, not much of, uh, of a choice, you know. It's, it's almost like um, a, a swim or sink uh, uh, scenario. And again, it's about a mindset. You need to, cost, to change the mindset. And of course, training and capacity building because, because these technologies change uh, all the time. So we, we always need to upgrade and uh, and to 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 upskill. Um, uh, that is my take on it. Um, and and I think as uh, in my space as universities, uh, we, there is really no choice. Maybe when you are sitting in a museum or an archive, you have some sort of choice to ignore this. But we can't. We're sitting with students uh, who need to be taught, and the only platform that is available now is to do it uh, digitally. So you 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 have no choice. You just have to do it and we provide as much support uh, as we can and upskilling um, as we can and we, we improve with time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think it's the same thing. Uh, maybe it's only that maybe resources permitting everyone would be taking it on. Uh, because I, I'm sure with some of the inquiries and the way the first world is going in terms of uh, moving with this digital, you know, technology, you risk, you know, being, you know, sent to, to, to the dungeons of, of oblivion, like Chabata was saying. So I, I don't know if 
there is anyone with a different contribution before we request our panelists today to give us their lasting and parting remarks? Is anyone of uh, in, in this group, uh, does anyone have something to say before we give our panelists uh, a chance to, 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 to give us their parting remarks? Ah, there seem to be no one. There seem to be no one. So I, I, by way of parting remarks, I will start with Chabata. Uh, I will do the reverse now. Uh, Chabata, then uh, Mata, then lastly Mavutu. Can, can you give us your parting remarks uh, to this discussion? Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Livingston. Uh, my parting remarks is just uh, my personal wish. I am just um, hoping, because I have no answers for that, that uh, the digital platform, and as, as we, have, we use the combined approach, will allow the social processes and the innovation, innovativeness that we created the very heritage we wish to teach and present are not um, uh, amputated, you know, by the change that has been brought on us and even aggravated at a, an unprecedented pace by the outbreak of the COVID pandemic. Because um, the heritage, you know, through socialization and in mingling of people, he has been he has been dynamic and uh, you know allowing generations to contribute uh, to the heritages and new heroes emerging, if you want, uh, and new values. So I hope uh, even with these digital uh, tools and platforms, we are still going to be able to you know to promote rather than stifle and amputate the very uh, processes that made the heritage uh what it is today and relevant because we don't want to be stuck in in, in just the past we also want uh the heritage to be for everyday people even in the digital world thank you uh, prof mataga thank you my my parting remarks really as you put perhaps pick up from my presentation i'm a firm believer in the project of decolonization um, and, and I really like the idea of um, underlying processes of education with, um, with the heritage. Um, and, uh, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the, way, the way to go. Um, we, we are trust in a moment where we, we have to engage with the digital world, but we should engage with it well, from a well-informed uh, position, a well-capacitated uh, position, and be able to give our students the, the critical skills to sift uh, what is good and what is not good. Uh, and then we, they prepare themselves adequately for the, for the world of work. But uh, thank you, Livingston. Uh, Mamvuto there. Thank you, Livingston. Uh, my parting remarks are that uh, I'm calling for more collaboration between our educational institutions and uh, I'm looking at uh, boundaries that are now bled. So let's capitalize on that and then engage each other. So we need more platforms where schools, galleries, and museums actually interact. Uh, let's engage the research-based approaches in our interactions. And uh, let's use the blended approaches. Technologies are important, but also the place-based learning is also important. Let's blend the two approaches uh, in our core generation of knowledge between and amongst the institutions. Otherwise, thank you very much, Livingston. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I, there was one question that was posed by Nesta, which was saying, what measures are being taken to protect online in Zimbabwe? And I felt this one was supposed to be addressed by someone who is, you know, in some position of authority and the archivist didn't manage to come and join us. And uh, that's why we didn't attempt to answer that one. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And unfortunately, uh, we have come to the end of this program, but that does not mean 
we are not going to having similar sessions in future. It can be either you guys, Dr. Mavuto, Prof. Mataga, or Mr. Chabata, I uh, mean, coming up with similar related, uh, uh, let's just, you know, like Mavuto is saying, the boundaries are now blurred. Let's just, you know, take that into consideration so that we keep, you know, sharing the ideas, we keep sharing the trends and dynamics in this profession. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I have no further, you know, remarks to this uh, session. And I hope and wish to see you again next you next time. I don't know when, but we could come up with similar, you know, sessions uh, end time along this year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Livingston. Thank you, thank you, Livingston. Goodbye. <laughs>